Well, hi there. This might be, sound creepy or morbid, but you don't want to die without first watching this video. I know nobody wants to talk about this, but if you have one of these or one of these, then you probably need this book. Yes, this book could change not only your perspective, but very possibly your life. Hi, my name is Luane and I work with the Glover Agency in the Metro Detroit area and I love making videos for my clients about Grand Lake, Michigan and everywhere around there. And if you are into that kind of thing, be sure that you stay to the end and hit like and subscribe. And if you're going to be making a move in and around the mid-Michigan area in the next three days, three months or three years, we really need to talk. You know, as Americans, we seem to accumulate a lot of possessions. And then we tend to just kind of hang on to them and store them until we become too old or sick to really do much with them. And eventually all of these items are left for our families to deal with. So when I read this book, it really was such a welcome idea. And it's not really meant to be morbid, but it's more of a shift in your perspective. And it made me realize that in a world where accumulation of possessions has become the norm, this concept could help many of us. But this approach to decluttering is far from grim. Instead, it's an exploration of life's impermanence and a call to take responsibility for the items that we surround ourselves with while we're alive. Understanding the term Swedish death cleaning is rooted in the Swedish term dostatni, which I'm sure I'm butchering, which literally translated come, means death clean. And it has garnered attention for its intentional and purpose-driven approach to organizing and disposing of one's belongings. As described by the pioneer of this movement, Margaret Magnusson, in her book, The Gentle Art of Swedish Death Cleaning, when you think about your possessions, be brutally honest with yourself and ask yourself if tomorrow I woke up dead, are there any things that I would be embarrassed for my kids to see? Like, do you have old love letters from your first love that your children might be reading and this isn't even their father? Or maybe you journal and you, there's things in your journal that you really don't want your children reading. These are all things that we can dispose of prior to our death. I went through my very first death cleaning 10 years ago when my mother and her husband both passed away within 10 months. And then 10 years later, when my father passed away and I was faced with settling his estate. This book really spoke to me because the author herself did her first death cleaning when her mother passed away and then later when her father passed away. Who knows, you may be going through something like this yourself right now. And one thing that I can attest to is that about death and the loss of a loved one is that it rarely comes at a convenient time. And I don't mean any disrespect in this at all. I can just tell you that when my mother passed, unexpectedly and suddenly, I had just a few weeks earlier gotten a cancer diagnosis that's going to require about a year of treatment. And I'd just gone through a separation from my husband. And then later when my father passed, well, my daughter, it, it kind of was expected, but it happened around the time of my daughter's wedding. And if you're like me, you're just busy living your own life. You have children that are going through various stages and you have work and then all of a sudden life throws you a curveball. It could be a bad diagnosis, it could be a wedding, it could be a death, it could be a divorce. And then suddenly you have a house filled with a lifetime of possessions to dispose of or sell during your period of grief. And meanwhile, life keeps going on. Now there was a good amount of stuff at my mother's home and her husband had recently been moved into a nursing home. It was very unlikely that he was going to ever be able to return to the home. So I was able to do both of their death cleaning, I guess you would say, at the same time. My initial response afterwards was just to move everything over to my place so that I could go through it at my leisure and when I was feeling like it. And I did just that. I moved all of it into my already full basement. 
And then fast forward five years, and it was all still in my basement. And every time that I went down there, I was overwhelmed with sadness and anxiety as I was faced with the reality of what to do with all of this stuff. And I really didn't realize the toll that it was taking on me. As initially, I was hesitant to part with anything. And there really wasn't all that much that I wanted from my mother's home. She had kind of already done her own version of death cleaning, even though it wasn't a thing back then, and had given out um, some of her possessions to my children, myself, years earlier. So I had pretty much all that I wanted. And there were photos and a few items that I still wanted to take from her home. And she kept them all this time. Then, fast forward to early 2017, I decided I was going to conquer this mountain of stuff and boy, I'm sure that the trash collectors called me a lot of bad names because the entire front of my home was just covered. The whole front yard was just filled with garbage. A lot of it was picked up by trash pickers and I didn't expect the sense of freedom and the moving forward that this gave me. I was nearly giddy. I was so happy for the first time in many years. Every item in our homes does have some type of level of cost, right? I mean, just being there, it either costs you space, it could cost you energy, uh, the time to maintain it, and it can really rob you of your peace of mind as it did mine with all of those things in my basement. Worrying about and wondering about what you're going to do with these items and the energy that it takes to dispose of them. Things that are no longer needed or useful in our lives. And I had a bit of an epiphany. And I realized that many items I own were of the same nature. I had saved toys for grandchildren that may never arrive. And I'm actually embarrassed to admit that I even had a collection of my children's teeth that they had left for the Tooth Fairy. Now I'm not really sure what I thought I was going to do with all of these teeth, but somehow they had remained in my dresser drawer Maybe I was gonna make a necklace out of them. I'm not really sure. And I started thinking about all the families I know with full homes, full storage units, and even full pole barns and airplane hangers. Their parents' homes were also neat and cleaning out, full of stuff for their kids to deal with. And I'll assure you of one thing, your kids are not gonna feel blessed with having to sort through all of your stuff that you never cared enough about to do anything with. And this is often illustrated when I arrive at their home to talk to them about listing it and there's a huge dumpster out front and everybody is throwing things into it. Now fast forward another five years and my own father was diagnosed with a terminal illness. And as life would have it, our daughter, who had to postpone her wedding for two times during COVID restrictions, was planning to have her wedding that summer. My father was dealing with a terminal illness at the time and his hospice nurse had pretty much assured us that nothing was probably gonna be happening anytime soon, that we had several weeks, maybe even another month by the look of things. So you can imagine our surprise when he passed away one hour before she went down the aisle. Now at the wedding itself, I didn't share that with anybody. I don't even think I told my own husband and kids that until after the wedding because I didn't want to put a shadow on the event. But right after the wedding, when we were so exhausted from all the preparations, we had to jump on a plane and, drive, and fly down to Florida to deal with his estate. And I quickly discovered that my father had a new hobby, garage sales. You know, being a depression baby and he was kind of a handy sort of guy, he loved a good deal. And let me just show you what the result of his new hobby was. So here are some photos and videos of his pole barn and home. Now I want you to notice um, in the rafters here how much wood is there. My father had a business as a trim carpenter for many years. Also the number of fishing poles. There was just one person there. That, look at all the fishing poles. They're up in the rafters. He had 12 CB radios and I don't even know how many lock sets he had accumulated over the years. And he had a bad habit of stashing money and valuables all over. 
and he admitted that over the years he had forgotten where a lot of these things were hidden. He had a pole barn and three other sheds full, as well as a trailer outside of the house, and they were all filled with everything you could imagine. He had a golf cart, and if he had one of something, he had 10 or 12. And he never got rid of anything. He just kind of kept adding to it. He had hundreds of t-shirts and button-down shirts. So many, in fact, that he could have probably worn a different one every single day and never had to do laundry for a year. He could have just tossed them away. He had a ton of bar glassware, though he hadn't drank in years. And his response when I would talk to him about this was, well, I only paid a dollar for it. But you know, nobody needs that many clothes. I mean, every closet in that five bedroom home was filled with clothing, shoes, belts, and belongings. He had so many knickknacks. I mean, you name it, he had at least four of them. He had four vacuum cleaners, 45 clocks, and the paperwork from every home, business, car, or boat he had ever bought or sold. Dragging everything over a thousand miles away to my house to deal with it just wasn't practical. So we engaged on a number of trips back and forth to my father's place, and we spent a whole week there just getting it livable for us so we could stay there during the cleanup. We had to get rid of all of the medical equipment that was still at the house, there was a bed, there was all types of items and a lot of nutrition that had all had to be picked up. And there was literally so many knickknacks in his home that I just had to put them in a bedroom because they were on every flat surface and it was so overwhelming for me and I was starting to become very anxious just looking around at what was needing to be done. But I knew unless I was willing to live there for several months, I wasn't going to be able to do this on my own. And it just wasn't possible. So I started calling estate sale companies and there's a lot of them in Florida and they're pretty busy. However, I mean, they, many were booked months in advance, but most of them felt that this job was just too big. So they turned it down. And then I had decided to hire an auction house that would come in and sell everything and they would leave the home all cleaned out and all the outbuildings. This entire process just to clean the house out took about four months. So from the time that I arrived there until the time that I actually signed the paperwork on the closing of his home, it was a whole nine months. I, you can grow a baby in that time, right? And I'm sure that he probably would have rolled over in his grave had he known what we actually received monetarily for all of the stuff in his house because he saw it as a big treasure trove. And only a few things really had any real value. The value was to him. The home itself, which was in a really lovely location on a canal, would need to be sold so that we could clean it out and sell the estate. I found a realtor in the area and she had several resources to help with clean up of the home and preparing it to go on the market. Realtors are always a great source for these, so make sure that you check in with one. And I want to show you all the items that were at my father's house. I brought back basically this box, which is full of pictures and memorabilia, and this guy. <laughs> he's kind of bulky, but my father has kept him, and he, he's got to be over 60 years old. My father won a trip, and this was a souvenir when I was a child that had been in our home for many, many years. And for some reason, it made me smile, so I brought it with me. So when my minimalist best friend handed me Margaret Magnuson's book, it occurred to me that I'm now the oldest generation in my family. And it's time that I probably start doing my own death cleaning. Over the years, I've helped so many families navigate the same experience. I've watched them do their own version of death cleaning after the passing of their parents, or they were moved to a nursing home, or maybe even in with them. So this seemed to be a really great topic to do a video on. And why not cut down on what we have before we lose the ability to take care of it on our own. And I'm going to share with you some tips that you could use to integrate this into your own life. I've recently become an empty nester and I'm promising myself that my 
children are not going to remember the heaps of stuff that they had to clean out of my house. Hopefully they'll, they'll remember all the good times that we had, not just of them cleaning out a bunch of junk. So minimizing your stuff is about maximizing the meaning and the joy in your life. This inspired me this last Christmas to get rid of some items as I was pulling out my Christmas things. I realized I have a lot of ornaments I need to get rid of. I gave some of those to my children. And I also had a number of plates that my mother had painted in ceramics and she would fill them with Christmas treats and give them to certain members of her family and friends. And this year I took some of those extra plates and made my own little batch of goodies and gifted them to my children. And they were really kind of excited about getting something that had once belonged to their grandmother. Now, here are some practical tips to help you to integrate death cleaning into your life straight from the book. Adopting these practical tips will help you to avoid leaving too much for your children. The first one is the one in and the one out rule. Now, I've been doing this with certain items that I tend to accumulate, being clothes and shoes, if you know me I have a lot of both and I've gotten to where when I buy one pair I get rid of the other. How many times do we buy clothing to replace something that's worn out, no longer looks good and we buy something new but we don't get rid of the first item that was already worn out. We don't donate it, we, we just throw more stuff in there. So every time I bring a new pair of shoes or a new top or something into my closet I take out two items I'm no longer using or that are worn out. So this helps you to, to keep some equilibrium where you're not just adding to the amount of things that you have. Keep the lines of communications open, especially with your aging parents. Talk with them about what they would like to do with all of the items that they have. Maybe there's some people that are they could, would like to gift some of their items to while they're still living. You know, you and your siblings can collectively help your parents to take care of the items that are in their house, at least some of it. And these, these decisions can be intentional and they can prevent future challenges. Do not start by going through your photographs. This has always been a huge mistake of mine. Oh, let's go through all these things. And I grab a box of photographs and what happens? I start looking, oh, who's this? Who's that? And what it does is it distracts you from getting further along in your cleaning. And also think about this, you can look through your photos much later in life when you're really not that physically able to do much else, you can still look through your box of photos. So that's something that you can save forever. Direct your energies at all the other stuff and leave the photographs to the end. And also start engaging in regular decluttering practices. Embracing an ongoing decluttering journey by identifying the things that are no longer useful in your life and releasing them after they've served their purpose and it will keep your living space free from unnecessary accumulation. Embracing change for a more mean meaningful life as we traverse through the different life stages, the significance of certain possessions evolves. When you have a house full of kids who are in sports, you have all the sports equipment, you have things to haul the sports equipment in, you may have a lot more pots and pans and dishes than what you need now is empty nesters. And Swedish death cleaning encourages us to wholeheartedly embrace these changes and to be candid about our current lifestyle. It extends beyond mere minimizing of stuff. Swedish death cleaning can actually be a compassionate act, not just for yourself, but for those you love. By proactively engaging in this process, you spare your loved ones the overwhelming task of navigating through a lifetime of your possessions and accumulations. But during moments when they are probably feeling a lot of loss and grief, I'd really love to hear what you guys think and if you want to start doing your own Swedish death cleaning. Really appreciate you tuning in today. And remember to like and subscribe. Thanks so much for tuning in.